world of bariatrics that we need to be used to. So we want to ensure that we are doing the best type of surgery for patients, however. And I think as we've learned more with the decade plus of the sleeve gastrectomy being done, we know there are pitfalls that can cause major problems, um, major problems with leaks from the early sleeve experience that were very difficult to get to seal and required additional surgery. So how do I do my sleeve? It's a fairly straightforward approach. I am of, of the school of thought that mobilizes the entire greater curve of the stomach first. So I divide all of those attachments laterally all the way up to the left cruise. I do expose the cruise to ensure there's no hiatal hernia. And then I place my sizing. I just, sorry, in I, I, just a question. So we will also discuss yes. about uh, technical points because we okay. have this series of questions that are repeated question. First of all, uh, we like to know about you, your brief introduction. Oh, absolutely. We'll start with that. I am a bariatric surgeon. I'm the division head of bariatric surgery at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon in the USA. I've been doing bariatric surgery now for 15 years. It doesn't seem like it could be that long, but I started my career with the US Army, actually. I trained in the Army and served as both doing trauma and general and bariatric surgery in the Army. I separated from the Army in 2010 and went back and did an additional fellowship at that point at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and then began my practice in primarily bariatrics. And I've practiced in Colorado and then in Oregon since I've separated from the Army. So I've had a lot of experience and been able to watch some different phases of bariatrics. I did a, a good number of bands when those first were more popular and I first started my practice. We went to sleeves and done bypasses throughout that time and have now added um, things like duodenal switch and Sadie as well. Excellent, Dr. Really, and it's great honor. Now I am talking with someone who has uh, experience of bariatric surgery more than one decade. So when and why did you start a sleeve gastrectomy? I did my first sleeve gastrectomy around 2008, um, and it was a new burgeoning surgery in the U.S. It was getting gaining popularity as perhaps they didn't need to a sleeve gastrectomy only as a first stage towards a duodenal switch, which was how it had been done in our country before, and that perhaps it had longer lasting results that could be good for a certain population. Uh, at that time in our country, it was not insurance approved yet. And so actually we worked through the phases of getting it approved for insurance coverage so that it could be done more um, commonly. And that happened with most plans around 2008 to 2009. So I, I found it's a straightforward surgery. It could be done on a lot of different patients. It could be done at very high body mass index. And I thought that was a nice aspect of this surgery is you could do it very safely in a higher risk patients. Uh, doctor, excellent. And also now you are doing about 15 years and about 14 years. So you are doing and performing a sleeve gastrectomy at this stage now in 2021, because during this period, so also you face a lot of side effects, complications and early, late, definite. And also you hear about this at this stage, what percentage of your bariatric surgery uh, practice so belongs to sleep gastrectomy? That's a great question because it's really evolved. I would say 10 years ago, almost 70% to 80% of my practice was sleeve. And now it's scaled back to about 40 to 50% sleeve. So it's shifting, I think, as you would somewhat expect, as we've learned more about the sleeve and outcomes with the sleeve, and that it might not be the perfect surgery for all patients. Uh, and so has decreased, but it's still a formidable number of patients that we're seeing that are getting a sleep gastrectomy. Excellent. Doctor, you know better than me. You are a surgeon and progressively when we see results of our any type of surgery, not only bariatric, so definite, we do some changes and our technique evolved definite also in your practice. So this evolution has been done for a sleep gastrectomy. Can you highlight that points so that you have changed during your practice for better results and less chance of complications. Absolutely. I think early on, uh, many of us likely believe that the tighter the sleeve, the better the sleeve. Yeah. That restriction was what everything was about and that's how your patients were going to have the best results. And I think almost everybody has stepped away from that 
thought processes saying just make it as tight as possible. We know dysphagia, reflux, all these things are very real. So my two probably highlighted things I've really changed since I first started doing it, doing the sleep gastrectomy is one, I, I use a phrase with all my trainees. I say, be kind to the incisura. Don't hug too tight on the incisura because I think that causes your gastric outlet obstruction that causes those proximal leaks that don't heal. So you know, really be cognizant of that there's an angle change there, that the food has to go around this angular change as well as empty out of the proximal stomach. So I tend to either actually measure uh, the, from the incisura about two and a half centimeters, um, even something three centimeters. Uh, so I stay well away from it so that there will not be an obstruction at that level. The other thing I've done too is that we really are careful of the angle of hiss and we've always dissected out the crura to make sure we don't have a mistyatal hernia, but now we don't necessarily hug right on the crura at the proximal aspect of the stomach. There's some uh, evidence in folks out there that believe you should leave those sling fibers intact to decrease the risk of reflux, try to keep that structural anatomy intact to decrease reflux. I can't say I do that fully because I do take the phrenoesophageal ligament but I do, um, I'm a little kinder at the angle of hiss as well. I leave a little more there, maybe one or two millimeters of tissue so that I'm not hugging my staple line right on the esophagus in that last staple fire. Uh, and I do think those two methods will generally keep you away from leaks. Uh, they may not, I, I can't say that they will change your weight loss or weight gain, but I think they'll help people swallow and they'll keep you away from proximal leaks of your stomach. Excellent points, doctor. As you highlighted, so this tightness of a sleeve is not no more important. And as you have mentioned, so this incisor angularis, uh, that is the most important, as well as that uh, easy junction or uh, his angle and distance. Uh, doctor, what is your protocol uh, regarding pre-op endoscopy and H. pylori eradication? I, my preference is to preoperatively uh, do an endoscopy on every patient if possible and test them for H. pylori. We have some insurance restrictions here in this state and in this country where for some patients we are unable to do that because insurance will not cover their endoscopy without a pre-existing condition. So unfortunately, I cannot always get every single patient uh, scoped ahead of time, but if it were, if I had an open bill and I could do it all the time, I would say, I think most of these patients deserve a preoperative endoscopy, um, a tissue biopsy for H. pylori. For the folks that we can't do a tissue biopsy ahead of time, we do still check either a fecal H. pylori or a serum level. So we do try to make sure they do not have H. pylori and eradicate it ahead of time if the test comes back positive. So excellent, if someone is positive, we do eradicate before surgery or some surgeons, what they do, they do surgery and then they continue that uh, treatment. So what's your protocol for eradication? Our protocol is to eradicate before surgery. Uh, and that's largely one because we already know GERD is an issue after surgery. So that could um, be confounding and confusing about what's making their acid reflux worse. But also, I think with these antibiotics, uh, some patients get very nauseated with them. They're heavy on your stomach. So patients tend to tolerate the treatment better when they have a normal stomach in my experience. Dr. My question, uh, because this is also, we have viewers, uh, also youngsters, and also they follow our interviews. Why you eradicate H. pylori before surgery? Or overall, what is the importance of H. pylori? Absolutely. So I think we, partially started doing it right out of our bypass practice because we were worried about marginal ulceration and gastric reflux in that setting. And obviously we don't have that marginal ulcer issue with the sleeve without an anastomosis, but reflux is still an issue. And I still do think the H. pylori can lead to gastritis, which can then uh, subsequently lead to hyperproduction of acid and acid reflux in patients. And so again, in a population where it could already be a problem after surgery, I think anything you can do to minimize that risk is going to be good for the patient. And again, treating it ahead of time when maybe it's less challenging for them to take that treatment and complete it fully all 14 days, because otherwise I've seen folks afterwards maybe try for seven days, 10 days. And I really think we should keep the treatment, the standard that it is either pre or post-surgery. And I think they tolerate it better uh, prior to surgery. 
Dr. my question uh, regarding same H pylori because we we this interview the target is this so because when uh, we we are talking about these uh, complications especially geared after sleep gastrectomy that is the challenge and in my opinion nowadays a hot topic in different international conferences always we hear geared after sleep geared after sleep but still sleep is the most common bariatric surgery at this globe what is my question definite you have faced geared after sleep gastrectomy and you have followed by endoscopy what is my question which how many these cases geared after sleep are h pylori positive have you any data is, yeah no i um if I look back at our data, I would say it's a very, very small percentage. Uh, and in, in our population, it's less than 5% that have a H. pylori positive test who have reflux afterwards. For anyone that does develop reflux after their sleep, we do fairly routinely do an endoscopy on them with a biopsy. And so that is something we would, if we were seeing it in high numbers, we would definitely be reporting it. We are not seeing it in high numbers. We get a, a rare H. pylori positive test after surgery in a patient that has reflux with their sleeve. So again, we're in an area though where it's not endemics. And so I think if you're at a place where there is more H. pylori infection and it's more common, that would be interesting to know is does that make any difference in a different population? So I think you do want to consider where are you practicing? What does your population have? And how, how common is H. pylori in your population? So doctor, it means, so this geared after a sleeve gastrectomy, the main reason is not H. pylori. So what is the main reason? So we must highlight these points. Mm -hmm. If we can solve these definite, then there will be less chance of geared after a sleeve gastrectomy. Yeah. You asked the million dollar question, why is this happening? <laughs> so um, one clearly is that we do interfere with our lower esophageal sphincter when we do a sleeve. Right. We are disrupting this tissue that has created this lower esophageal sphincter. There's no real muscle there that's creating it very specifically. There's no pylorus there, but we have our sling fibers on our stomach. We have our phrenoesophageal ligament. We have this angle of kiss. And every time we do a sleeve, we've disrupted that. And so that does have to contribute in some way, you would think, to reflux. Um, I think we also take a system that goes um, in where our food normally goes from our esophagus into a, a stomach that it can empty in with relatively low resistance and very easily empty into. And when we tubularize that stomach, we cause some restriction um, and slowing down of that emptying potentially. It just basically, I always describe it as in physics, when you have linear flow versus some turbulent flow, you're, you're taking this linear flow and making it even tighter. So it might cause a little challenge and restriction there. And so um, there is likely, an element of it is that it's harder for things to travel through there potentially, and particularly if people have any kind of esophageal issues to begin with. So if they have any dysmotility or challenges with propulsion of their uh, food through their esophagus, it's probably going to be harder for it to then move into a tubularized stomach versus a larger stomach. And then distal obstruction. I, I think we always have to make sure we're not obstructing the stomach distally. If you don't have outflow, then things are going to back up. So if you're causing any kind of distal obstruction, whether it's at the incisura or anywhere else, you're going to have acid backing up. And then it's more of a stasis than it is necessarily acid reflux. But to the patient, it feels like acid reflux. And quite often, if you study them, it looks like acid reflux too. Uh, but your manometry may give you some clues that this is actually more stasis and things are just not moving through the stomach distally for some reason. So I think it's hard because it technically could be multifactorial. Um, and then you add the mix of, or is it even acid reflux? Are they having bile reflux as well that might be causing these symptoms? So uh, this is an area that the reason it's a hot topic is because we haven't figured it all out, right? We need to continue to study it and figure out who gets it the most commonly. Why do they get that um, reflux more commonly than others? And what are, I think we know treatments, but are there folks that should go straight to surgery versus those that maybe don't need surgery to correct that? Yeah, excellent, doctor. So why I am asking this? Because now if we see a surgeon like you and many others who are also expert of sleeve gastrectomy and did thousands of cases, they have a standard technique. There is in technique, there is no issue in patient selection. There is no issue they have there. We will also discuss about patient selection because that is the most important in my opinion in any type of bariatric surgery, we will talk about this. But when you select a correct patient, 
your technique is a standard technique again you face such a situation so definite as you have mentioned this is multifactorial we cannot ask only due to technique only due to this we face yes same patient same technique so patients are like so uh, same like this ethnicity dietary protocol everything same mm -hmm. but one patient is okay fine lose weight excellent but other one same situation but now suffering with such a situation are you agree with me i absolutely agree with you i think that's probably again the most frustrating thing about reflux after sleeve is that most of us are very standardized in how we do everything and you do the same sleeve in three patients, four patients, five patients in a row, why does one of them potentially develop reflux and the other four do not? And they can even have similar comorbidities before surgery. They can have similar body mass indexes, weight, height. Uh, and so, like you said, it seems it has to be multifactorial and it makes it harder to self-select out who should not get a sleeve when you have that uncertainty of uh, who exactly is getting the reflux afterwards. Yeah, excellent. Uh, doctor, regarding mm -hmm. patient selection, so one of the question is, uh, in your opinion, uh, what is the relative and absolute contraindication of a sleep gastrectomy? Absolutely. Uh, for us, if we see severe esophagitis on endoscopy preoperatively, so if we're looking at grade C esophagitis um, and any level of esophagitis with treatment with uh, PPI, we're usually going to counsel the patient pretty strongly about thinking about a, a gastric bypass. And this is especially for people that have silent reflux. We have scoped some people, they didn't even know they had any acid reflux and they have fairly severe esophagitis. So that's one. Um, extensive Barrett's disease, if they have Barrett's esophagus already developed, we will sometimes allow a little leeway if it's a very short segment and there's a compelling reason that they need to have a sleeve. But generally speaking, uh, if there is already Barrett's present, we will again lean towards gastric bypass. So those are probably our two strongest indications. Um, for people that are coming to us for esophageal dysmotility issues in addition to weight loss, again, we strongly usually will recommend that they go towards gastric bypass as well. Okay, doctor, thank you. And regarding this, uh, uh, so if we see this uh, GERD, uh, so sometime as you have mentioned, so this is a silent reflux and uh, there is uh, no symptoms, but so incidentally, we see there is severe esophagitis. So what is my question in this, during this period, so now more than one decade you are doing uh, sleep gastrectomy, how many cases do you see Barrett esophagus? Again, I think I find this to be very rare. It probably only will change management and a small percentage of patients that we'll see on Barrett's that we didn't suspect was there um, in a patient that doesn't have reflux. I think in our refluxing population, we will on occasion see a short segment Barrett's. It's usually um, very rare that we'd see a long segment or a more aggressive uh, version of Barrett's but uh, it's worth screening for because it has changed some of our managements where you've seen either some esophagitis or Barrett's in someone that you weren't expecting to see it in. And then we were able to talk to them about bypass a little more in depth. And uh, even if they have very mild reflux, but they know that there's a precancerous potential, a lot of patients will reconsider their choice of the sleeve gastrectomy. And so I think a lot of counseling goes into that, knowing what their esophagus looks like. Yeah, yeah. Back in Asia Pacific mm -hmm. country, so the, this short segment, uh, Barrett esophagus is the most common, not long mm -hmm. one. And also, you know better than me, in these countries, there is more chance of gastric carcinoma. If someone has family history of gastric carcinoma, also suffering with the short, not long Barrett. So as I, I have talked with different surgeons, they go ahead for a sleeve gastrectomy in mm -hmm. such a cases and they never risk because they need follow up because when we do oh, gastric bypass, okay, they have no access to remnant. So have you faced such a cases in your country? Yeah, uh, we have a pretty different population in that we don't have such a high incidence of gastric cancer. And so it's not as much of a consideration, but I do think for uh, countries where their incidence of gastric cancer is high, you have to definitely take that into consideration. Uh, what I'll parallel it to in my practice a little bit is we do a good number of patients that are pre-transplant in our um, university setting. So 
they're needing to go on to get a liver, a kidney, heart, lungs, you name it. And for those patients, when we see short segment Barrett's on them that we powwow and talk with our GI folks, we have a, a multidisciplinary conversation and say, though logically the sleeve may be a better option for these very sick patients um, because we can do the surgery more efficiently. We can get them off the table with less general anesthesia time or a lot of considerations in those types of patients. And so if I, when I talk to my GI colleagues, we agree that ablation of that Barrett's is a potential if it needs to happen in the future, that there are endoscopic treatments that can take place first. Uh, and I usually include our foregut surgeons in the conversation as well, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that do the colon transpositions now if there's an esophageal problem. But you know, by and large, I think we all tend to agree that if the patient needs a sleeve for some other reason, that a short segment variance is not going to be what stops us from offering the sleeve for a compelling reason. And to me, gastric cancer that's going to be at a higher incidence than esophageal cancer is a pretty compelling reason uh, for considering a sleeve gastrectomy. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Doctor, excellent. Uh, so uh, if, if, we, if we talk about, uh, uh, so because we also face, as you have mentioned, uh, many types of uh, Pre-op, because now we are talking about patient selection. If someone consult mm -hmm. with hiatal hernia and you have diagnosed a hiatal hernia before surgery, not during surgery, so what is your protocol for such a case? Yes, I think I, I may ruffle some bariatric surgeon feathers and that I don't consider a hiatal hernia as a contraindication for sleeve. Now, if they have a large paraesophageal hernia, so we're talking about like grade fours, et cetera, then I do tend to offer the paraesophageal repair with a gastric bypass. If they have a sliding hiatal hernia that's fairly easily reduced and we can re reinforce the cura with a suture um, repair, then we will do a hiatal hernia repair with a sleeve gastrectomy. And if the, again, patient's more compelled that they like the sleeve for whatever reason, or they, they would prefer that, we'll offer that first. And uh, many a time, again, it comes down to how symptomatic is their heartburn? How much does it bother them? Uh, I have a long conversation with my patients about if your heartburn were to get worse from how it is right now, how would you feel about that? Is that tolerable? If it's absolutely not tolerable that you would need to increase your Prilosec or Nexium or whatever medication you're on, then perhaps we should be talking about a gastric bypass. But I, I don't think a hiatal hernia is an absolute contraindication to a sleeve. I think we all fix hiatal hernias. We know how to do good hiatal hernia repairs at the time of surgery. So do a good dissection of the crura, do a posterior repair at the same time, and then do a good sleeve and, and see how the patient does. Excellent. Uh, Doctor, can you share any experience? Yeah. So especially a large size hiatal hernia, parasophageal are sliding and uh, after surgery, so that situation becomes worse. So I think I have seen cases where patients definitely got recurrent hiatal hernias after sleeve. So they came back with worsening uh, symptoms and they had a uh, large recurrence of their hiatal hernia, a large amount of their sleeve and their chest and that's definitely problematic. And those patients usually are feeling it quite significantly. Um, when I was at Emory, we did look at our combined large parasophageal hernia repair with sleeves and obese patients. And I, um, if I remember correctly, we reviewed around 16 to 20 patients that we did that um, combined surgery on. And we found that it was one really uh, safe procedure to do at least for short term. And there wasn't an increased recurrence rate of those large parasophageals. And we thought or at that time, our hypothesis was if we're helping patients lose weight, potentially maybe taking some pressure off that area. So decreasing the recurrence rate. This was our follow-up at that time was fairly short, however. So I can't say at five years or 10 years if that stands, but um, you know, have at least looked to see if it's rational to do these repairs in the short term and seeing that there was no change in the 30-day morbidity mortality, mm -hmm. no change in the short-term outcomes at the very least say, well, it's, it's likely safe to do. But I think anecdotally, we all have had someone who has either developed a recurrent hiatal hernia or a new hiatal hernia after a sleeve. And when we image them with their upper GI, we see a large portion of their stomach and their chest. And they oftentimes have a really hard time swallowing. They have a lot of reflux. Um, and so when you're taking them back, then what's the next surgery you do? And if you've already fixed the hiatus one time, you know it's always harder to do the second repair, the third repair, and the fourth repair. 
So uh, I think you want to be diligent to choose the surgery that hopefully will take you back to the operating room the least amount of times and not have to go back and dissect out the hiatus multiple times because I find it it's a little more dangerous each time you go in that area. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Dr. One of the issue that is a nightmare also for surgeon and the patient is leak after receiving gastrectomy. So can, can you highlight some points? Already you have talked about uh, incisor angularis and different, uh, but so why, what is my question regarding reinforcement of uh, stapler line? So for prevention of mm -hmm. uh, a leak, or if you add any point, so for our youngsters, mm -hmm. what they must do yeah. to prevent such a nightmare? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Leak, I think, is our most dreaded issue in these patients. And stable line reinforcement, I think when we look at the data, we've seen that it may decrease bleeding. Uh, I don't believe there are many studies that have shown that it actually decreases leak in any kind of statistically significant fashion. Uh, there was even one study that showed that it might increase the risk of leak um, in a large uh, mega metadata study. So I think it's a little controversial about does it truly decrease leak? But I think many of us still use it. Uh, I personally do use reinforcement and I think it does likely help with bleeding more than it does with leak. I think it helps with some compression of those staples and adding a little bit of compression on your staple line. Um, I find that the staples lines are also easy, easier to manipulate when you have a seam guard or a reinforcement of some sort on them. You can oftentimes easily place clips over them and take care of any oozing that you see. Uh, but I think the data obviously does not tell you you have to use any kind of staple line reinforcement. It's a very mixed bag in that data. And so it's more of a personal choice. How do you want to do your procedure and how does it handle for you best? How can you manage that uh, to avoid the leaks? Exactly what I referred to before. You want to make sure you're not distally narrowing your stomach. If you've gotten too tight on your incisura, uh, that's going to be a problem. One of the things I recommend doing, and I don't know how many people do it, but I do on table endoscopy on all of my patients. So at the end of the surgery, I like to fill that stomach up with a little bit of air and see, does your staple line twist? Does it um, deform when it gets air filling in the stomach? Because to me, that may, tells me a little bit about what might happen when the patients start to eat and drink and they're swallowing. If I see an immediate twisting, torquing, uh, if it looks like the incisure is very tight, I like to know that ahead of time. In some cases, I have done a revision right there on the table if I thought I really made a bad mistake and it was too tight. But more often than not, I at least have some notes for myself to say, pay attention to this if the patient is having problems and know that maybe this is going to be an issue down the, down the road. So I oftentimes tell people, if you're doing on-table endoscopy, it's not always for a leak test per se, although it's nice. If you have a clear technical error where a staple line didn't hold or a suture didn't hold, you'll see it when you insufflate with endoscopy. You'll see those bubbles and identify it. Otherwise, it may not be that sensitive, but what it will tell you is a little clue of how are you creating the stomach? Are you keeping your staple line straight? Are you twisting them? Um, are you unevenly retracting on your stomach so it's causing a lot of torque and torsion on your stomach? Um, all of these subtle things likely contribute to things like leak and problems emptying and reflux. So kindness again, kindness on your incisura, kindness on your tissue and staple line and remembering to not put too much tension on anything. Uh, and then proximally on your sleeve leaks, since most of them come proximal, choose the right staple height, right? The stomach is thinner on the proximal aspect versus the antrum. So I personally do not think you need to use a high staple height um, on the top of the stomach when you get proximal on it. I think you can probably think about scaling down a little on your staple height and again, maybe using a reinforcement um, if you're using the same staple height so that you get good approximation of your tissue on the proximal part of the stomach and leaving a little bit uh, of that angle of hiss so that you're not hugging your esophagus and have a weak spot where you go from G junction to the stomach, because I think those were the causes of many of the early leaks. So doctor, this is a great message. So kindness to tissue and respect to tissue is the main point, key point, that is for our youngsters. So doctor, if we, if we detect any twist during surgery, so are you prefer to fix this twist or this sleep to so base of momentum or omentopexy? What's your opinion about omentopexy? Yeah, quite honestly, I don't think an omentopexy does much probably. 
but I think it makes us feel better, right? Because it looks better when you fixed it and then you're like, oh, look, now it's staying straight. <laughs> but my suspicion is that as soon as the person eats or drinks it, probably if it's going to Taurus, it's going to Taurus. So again, I use that more as general information for myself. If patients are reporting to me after they start, especially as they progress to solid food, if they're having more difficulty swallowing, if they're feeling food sticking and it's really not going through their stomach. I think we have a tendency sometimes in bariatrics to blame the patient, right? We tell them, well, you're not chewing it well. You're eating too much, you're eating too fast. And I think it's really important we make some notes on these kinds of technical things as we see them so that if you hear that, you can say, oh, let me look at my notes. Did that sleeve look straight? When I insufflated it, did the staple line twist? Did it cork? Did it do anything strange? So then maybe you can correlate. Are there symptoms matching something you saw? And that might change your approach to how you work it up and what you do in the future. Um, so do I do omentopexy? Sometimes I do. Again, I think it's I, more for my health than the patient's health, and it makes me feel better that I've done something. Um, I often also try to really lay the staple line flat as I lay the liver down. So when I take my liver retraction out, I will really pull that staple line flat so the liver weight maybe will hold the stomach flat. And again, I don't know how much it does that, but I always think the liver is probably more robust than the omentum and maybe reinforcing some of that. So if I have my staple line like flat under the liver, maybe that will help it. Excellent. Doctor, have you any experience of a sleeve in adolescents? And adolescents, yeah, we started our adolescent program about two years ago here and um, have done some sleeves in adolescents. And we really like that surgery for this population. They, uh, they have great recovery. Kids just bounce back from surgery in a pretty amazing fashion. Uh, and we like it because it doesn't really burn any bridges for them. A lot of them are so early in life, they, they don't know if they're going to need an anti-inflammatory medicine in the future. So it allows them to be able to use that. Um, Tom Inge's work out of the teen lab studies show that these, these young people that were having surgery actually maintained their weight loss really nicely when they looked back at them over many years. And so it's definitely given me um, reinforcement of saying we see adolescents with challenges and obesity that we should really be um, interested in treating them and not putting it off. Because my fear is if you put it off, you may take an adolescent who has a body mass index in the 40s, maybe weighs in the 300s, and then you'll see them as an adult with a body mass index in the 60s and weighing closer to 500 pounds. And so um, you want to try and catch that disease process as early as possible if you can. Definitely, it will be effective. Doctor, have you any limitation of high BMI for sleeve gastrectomy? Uh, so one question and another. So sometime when patient is more super morbid obese, like above 60, 70 BMI. And just you think about step surgery for this patient. Have you talked with the patients? Yes, we will do a sleeve. And then maybe after this, so we will go ahead for bypass. But when you did a sleeve, you achieved the target with that sleeve. Same patient, now 300 kg, 250 kg. But just with the sleeve, patient is now 190. And then no need to go for bypass. Yeah, absolutely. We do offer stage surgeries, and I think I've um, done a good number of sleeve revision to bypass. Uh, and now that we have started doing more duty and we'll switch as well, we will offer sleeve to DS as well. And when we look at our super obesity patients with those very high body mass indexes, we will often offer them a sleeve as our first stage with the thought that, okay, maybe when they get down at a, six months to a year later, we can do the next stage of the duodenal switch or the bypass, whichever seems the most appropriate at that time. Uh, but yes, I know I think of one patient off the top of my head for sure that I thought will need a revision for certain and they lost almost half of their body weight um, and very happy with where they landed. And I thought, well, this happens every once in a while, right? Every once in a while you see that super responder to surgery and we are not clear why that happens in some patients. And I suspect that some of them likely have a really robust hormonal response to the surgery too. Um, we know GLP-1 now is clearly involved in this as we see these GLP-1 medications coming out and having more success. So I always wonder if the super responders to the sleeve, are they the ones that get a better GLP-1 response? Do they get a more robust peptide YY response? What, what happens and what differentiates them I don't know what that is, but I have definitely had a few who never came back for step two. And I think that is a good sign. 
with that being said, I think I've also had the under responders to this sleep, those folks that lost maybe, you know, 15 kilograms, 20 kilograms, and, you, and they really want more. And you're wondering, well, why did they stop early? They seem to be a, doing the same thing as our other patients. So uh, the sleeve, I, I do think compared to the other surgeries is a little more finicky in that respect because there's a, a huge spectrum of weight loss that we can see with it. And again, I think our job is to figure out how did we do our surgery? Are we technically doing it sound? And then remembering not to pass all the blame to the patient because again, we often will say, well, they must be snacking all the time. They must be doing this. And I think some people respond differently to every surgery for different reasons. Um, and the behavioral ones, usually you can intervene and see some change, but many of them are actually sticking to a very good diet. They're following your instructions and they've just, they've gotten their max that they can lose from that specific surgery. Excellent, Dr. Why I am asking this question. Definite after surgery, the role of patient is very important and that lifestyle change. So if patient follow proper that instruction of the doctor and change lifestyle, Maybe with the sleeve gastrectomy, they can achieve the target. So uh, doctor, another question regarding sagging after, in such a patient, so with morbid obesity or super obese, so definite there is more chance of sagging. What is your instruction for such a case? Uh, because they have speedy reduction of weight, definite when they have a sleeve or any type of barrier. So because we are now discussing right. about sleep, Definitely, they have a speedy so weight reduction. So mm -hmm. what is your uh, instruction for such a case for the prevention of sagging? So and um, we're talking about the soft tissue, right? When they have the loose tissue in the front that's sagging more. Um, that I generally tell people we can't predict how much uh, loose skin or sagging they will have. And it is going to be more if they lose more weight and if they lose it more rapidly. I can't give them any sound advice. I obviously tell them do strength training, try to really vary the activity you're doing so that you build muscle and develop your lean muscle in your body as much as possible. But at the end of the day, that skin is going to be there. And so if you're having sagging of your skin, the only people I know that can effectively fix that are our plastic surgery partners. Um, they need to see you and talk about what can be done. And especially if they've lost massive amounts of weight, that is usually just, it's just a large problem that it can't be easily taken care of with creams or ointments or exercise. It has to be something that's surgically addressed. So my only advice to them is as they're losing their weight to try and diversify their exercise, do some strength training and build your muscle as well so that you have good lean muscle mass and strength. Um, and then see what your skin looks like afterwards and your sagging of your skin looks like afterwards. And then we'll connect you with a plastic surgeon so that you can talk to them about the next steps. So doctor, what is your opinion about uh, usage of protein shakes? Because in sleeve gastrectomy, definitely it is different than vanonostomosis gastric bypass. In OAGB, yes, patient can eat because personally, so I am doing these cases, but in a sleeve gastrectomy, that is a restrictive procedure, the patient cannot eat. Are you agree or have you any experience or you suggest your patient to use protein shakes after surgery? I do. I recommend all of my bariatric patients use some protein shakes after surgery. And I, I tell them, I don't anticipate they have to do this forever because I think a lot of patients worry that their new um, normal is that they're going to have to always drink protein shakes. Um, so really reinforcing to them, as you heal, hopefully you will be able to eat some regular foods. You'll have smaller portion sizes. And I really want my patients ultimately to be eating a whole food, real food diet. I tell them less processed foods, let's eat your fruits and veggies and lean proteins that are healthy for you down the road. But for the first four, six weeks, sometimes for some patients, two to three months, even until they can advance to those more thick foods and the really healthy foods, the protein shakes are a great way to stay hydrated and give you your protein both in one. Uh, and they're about the only thing that's going to give patients as much protein in one serving that will give you that powerful ability to hopefully, again, preserve some of your lean body mass and your lean muscle mass. Because I think otherwise, when patients lose their weight too fast, I suspect that they're losing a lot of lean muscle mass. Uh, and that can make them feel like they, although they've lost weight, like they don't feel as strong, they don't have the same endurance, they feel very fatigued. 
So I, I will recommend early after surgery, we recommend they drink two to three protein shakes a day or protein waters. As they get further out, they can decrease those numbers um, with the hopes that they're gonna be able to get protein through other sources. Yeah, excellent. Back to another issue of a sleeve gastrectomy is the dehydration, especially because now we are living in Dubai and you know better than me. So there is hot season and also patients always face such a situation. Personally, what I do, because patient stay is one night stay sometime. So I also prefer to uh, so give them some IV uh, fluids, so two or three days. It depends on the patient. So have you any protocol for uh, such a cases? Yeah, well, we do, where I am, we don't face as much hot weather. We have a lot of rain here, but <laughs> I have practiced in warmer places for certain, and I do agree with you. I think it's something you really have to watch out for. One of our protocols in place is we tend to be very generous with IV fluids around the time of surgery. So um, when they have their fluids started prior to surgery, we don't usually stop them until they leave the hospital, even if they're drinking well, just so they have that extra little boost of IV fluids afterwards. And obviously we make sure they're not a heart failure patient or someone that we're gonna fluid overload, but we do want to be generous with the IV fluids. And then we totally agree with what you've said. Our, our post-operative protocol, we have set up to where we can start IV fluid infusions as an outpatient in either an infusion clinic or um, even in some primary care clinics, they can support that. So wherever it can be supported, that if someone's struggling, that we can make sure that they can get an IV fluid infusion after surgery. And I think you just find some patients will need a little added support. Others, the majority will not need it, but there are a few that will be very helpful. So you just give them one or two liters of fluid a few days after surgery, it will get them over that hump of being able to drink enough fluids to stay hydrated. And I think you have to really consider it when you're in a, a warmer climate where they can get dehydrated more readily. Yeah, yeah, thank you, doctor. Doctor, another issue that sometimes we face after bariatric surgery and especially sleeve gastrectomy is a portal vein thrombosis. Have you faced such a situation? What is the reason of uh, this portal vein thrombosis? Because mostly mm -hmm. we routinely we see after a sleeve. We never seen this after any type of gastric bypass. So how can we prevent this, uh, uh, this problem, this issue that is really a disaster in yeah. my opinion in bariatric surgery? Absolutely. Yeah, I have seen it thankfully only I think one or two times in my career, but I've definitely read about it and read up on it a lot. Um, and I think exactly what you said, the dilemma is that we only see it with the sleeve and we don't see it with other procedures. So some would say, oh, it's because of the liver retraction, but we use the same liver retraction in all of our other procedures. And oftentimes we're actually retracting on it a little longer with some of the other procedures. So I think about the sleeve and say, well, what's different about it than the bypass, for example, when um, we're operating the same area and we don't see this? Well, we divide the short gastric vessels and we divide some branches of the gastroepipoic. So in some way, are we altering the flow of blood through that system and causing some clot propagation somehow? I mean, I think, again, this is likely one of these perfect storm type situations where there's not one answer. Our liver retraction probably impairs some of the portal venous flow. And so maybe we've got a little slow flow to the liver. Then we divide these vessels and maybe we have altered flow on the splenic side as well. Uh, and then oftentimes, I think the number one risk in these patients is a history of any kind of VTE in the past, either DVT, PE in the past. So if we know those are risk factors for them, then we um, have to watch out for that patient population. So patients who have had any kind of clotting in the past, who have a family history of clotting, they might be at a higher risk. With that being said, there are reports of patients that have had it with no family history of clotting, uh, no personal history of clotting, and they still develop it. And so high index of suspicion after surgery, if someone's having a lot of pain that's out of proportion to what you expect, it's out of the ordinary for a sleeve, they need imaging and you need to look at that um, portal venous area very closely and make sure that there is not some kind of a clot in that area. Uh, but yeah, I suspect something about mobilizing the greater curve of the stomach combined with liver retraction. And then again, a propensity towards clotting is probably mixing together with this surgery. Thankfully, the incidence is still low. I think it's reported around 0.4, 0.5%. So it's not a high, high incidence, but it's very serious when it happens. Yeah, thank you. Doctor, because we are also surgeon and as well as we are scientists and definite, we deal with the people directly. And one of the 
issue after a sleep gastrectomy is weight regain. Which percentage of your patients are suffering with weight regain after a sleep gastrectomy? You ask a very good question. And I think it's honestly, I want to say that it's going to be around the same as what the bypass is. I think we're going to see a 15 to 20% weight regain after sleeve gastrectomy. And I think the data is showing that there may be a higher incidence of weight regain after sleeve versus bypass. Uh, it's likely a very different sensation of fullness and restriction. And as, as the patients get further out, there's that propensity or ability to drink more of their calories and maybe take in more calories through the day with the sleeve. So um, I'm a little fearful and I think that's why my sleeve population has decreased over the last decade. Um, I think that the regain rate in the sleeve is likely gonna be higher. And I think we have to watch out for that and probably really be aggressive of following our sleeve patients every year. And if we start to see regain to be um, fairly aggressive about thinking about intervening with medical therapy early. Uh, I don't think waiting until they regain 30, 40, 50 pounds, uh, you know, something like that before starting an intervention is a good idea. I think if they start to uptick and they call you and they're worried, um, I've really been more aggressive about starting medications for those patients and, and doing multimodal therapy for them. Yeah. Doctor, we have a question on Facebook uh, from Dr. Mijda Ismail. He's from Iraq. He's a well-known bariatric surgeon in north of Iraq. His question regarding that uh, portal vein thrombosis. So when you suspect, so definitely in my opinion, the question is about the symptoms of uh, portal vein thrombosis and when you will go for CT scan. I would say if when I, from when I've seen this personally, I've seen it as being a patient who is a one to two weeks out from surgery and they're still having abdominal pain that is pretty intense. Abdominal pain still requiring narcotic pain medications or any pain that when we see the patient it seems out of proportion to their exam. So again, their exam and everything else is fairly benign or normal, but they're having an excruciating pain that's making them jump off the table or they're describing as more intense. We'll scan them straight away if we're seeing that. There, I find in most of my sleeve patients, by the time they're about one week out, their pain is really decreasing markedly. And ideally, if they did need narcotic meds, they're coming off of those. Um, many of them it's managed with just acetaminophen is very effective for their pain at that phase. So if I'm seeing folks that are having an intense pain when they're heading upwards of a week, I, I do start to get concerned. Is something else going on? And at that phase, I don't think you're just specifically looking for portal venous thrombosis. I think you're also wanting to make sure you don't have a leak, you don't have a hematoma, you don't have anything else that's going on even an infection, a soft tissue infection at that phase, you may wanna make sure. So the scan can serve multiple purposes, but uh, if it, anything that seems uh, out of the norm, norm, which to me the norm is when patients are hitting five to seven days, they really should actually be reporting that their pain is decreasing intensity, not increasing in intensity. Yeah, definitely. So Dr. Another thing, so uh, we have some time we do uh, that, uh, standard sleeve gastrectomy and earlier also you have mentioned sometime this weight loss struck. Yes, everything was okay. But after six months, just patient lose 20, 25 kg, 30 kg. But now there is no weight loss. So yes, we, we, can, uh, we can start that GLP-1 derivatives or other medication. So what is your routine protocol in such a case? Just imagine a young lady, 40, 45 years old, 115 kg. Now she lost 15, 20 kg. Now she's 90 after six months. But now start, again, she start to gain weight within six months. What yeah. will you do? Absolutely, right? These are, these are the challenges we face, I think, every day, yeah. quite honestly, is the varied response to our surgeries. The patients that um, start out with what looks like a fairly good response and then they plateau too early and they, or they slow down. So our protocol used to be that we wouldn't even offer medications until they hit almost a year out from surgery. And I don't know why we chose a year. It was just kind of an arbitrary, this looks like a good time if they're struggling. So our biggest modification is just what you said. We will offer medications now starting as early as three months out from surgery and sometimes even earlier than that. Uh, we try, tend to see where they're trending and their weight loss um, 
quartile based on some of, again, the lab studies that Dr. Kokolis and the groups um, published. And if they're in that lowest quartile where they're really at the lowest weight loss at each point, we will add those medications fairly early on to see if we can get a more robust response. We go over um, expectations with them as well. And part of this, again, is I think pre-op counseling and talking about that the weight loss can really be a wide spectrum. And even if you are in the lower weight loss, you've still achieved a lot and reinforcing that. So check in with our psychologist, et cetera, to say, hey, you've not failed. You've still achieved a lot of weight loss. It may not seem like it's a, a lot to you and it seems like it's too early to stop, but that you've done a lot there. Let's work with the medications. Let's see if we can get more robust response with the medications. Uh, and they continue on our, our normal pathway. They still are meeting with our dietitians. They're still checking in with us to make sure their medications are otherwise managed. Uh, I think a lot of patients, there are a lot of confounding factors. They have meds sometimes that cause weight gain and it's hard to get off those meds. A lot of them are on psychotropic meds and so they can't come off of them because if they have schizophrenia, bipolar disease, or these things, they can't change those medications, but they make it hard to lose weight. Um, if they're taking insulin for their diabetes, that makes it hard to lose weight. And so you have to take a look at them holistically. And again, don't reprimand them. Don't just tell them they're doing bad, but encourage them and then try to help with the medications as much as you can. And, and down the road, I think on these low weight responders, those are the folks that I have kind of flagged ahead of time to watch because they may be the ones that need a revision to something like a switch or a bypass in the future. Yeah, doctor, thank you. Doctor, another question regarding it after receiving gastrectomy. So which percentage of your patients are suffering with gait after receiving gastrectomy? Any type scared, just yeah. symptoms? I think when we look at our numbers, we are seeing about a, around a six to 8% rate of patients after sleep with GERD, uh, symptomatic GERD. So right. again, this is you know, not screening them with endoscopy and then seeing something. And so it's not a, a huge percentage, but it is a very real percentage. You know, about one out of 10 patients will come back telling us they have some new heartburn or worsening heartburn from before. So again, I think it's something we have to keep focusing on and figure out, are there ways that we can prevent it? Is it a technical error that we're causing this? Or is it just that some patients are more prone to it and what can we do to prevent it? I'm gonna be really intrigued to see as they study procedures like that Lynx procedure, the magnetic sphincter augmentation with sleeve gastrectomy. Does that help? Is that something durable? Uh, like many bariatric surgeons, I hate the idea of putting more prosthetics around the GE junction, but we wanna have options for these patients. And I think that there should be more than just the option of, of converting them to a gastric bypass. Um, we should medically really optimize them as much as we can and then see what else can we do for them. But again, I think it's a real incidence, it's there. And if you're saying you're a sleeve surgeon and you never see reflux, I usually say it means you're never seeing your patients yeah. after surgery. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So doctor, what is your protocol of PPIE? So after a sleeve gastrectomy for the prevention of such a situation? Yeah. So we put everyone on PPI for at least the first 30 days after surgery. We tend to titrate them off of it by three months. So sometime between the 30 days and the 90 days, they will get weaned off of the PPI if they're not having any reflux symptoms. And obviously if they have reflux symptoms then they start back on it and then they stay on it indefinitely. So we don't really stop it if they're having symptoms. We, we say, okay, keep it going. They do, we ask them to follow us with us every year. And so when we see them in a year, if they wanna try again to wean off their PPI and see if the reflux has gotten any better, we're happy to do those weans at different times to see if reflux is improved. Um, but at least for the first month to three months, we wanna keep people really medically well controlled so they can focus on hydrating and getting their protein in and everything else they need to do. So excellent doctor. So regarding also, GERD, so because you know better than me, GERD is the issue, especially after a sleeve gastrectomy. And also you have mentioned, so because, what's my question regarding your personal experience, how many cases were suffering with intractable GERD after sleeve? And so then there was a, some surgical intervention for, for the treatment of the GERD. So it was linked, mm -hmm. uh, so convert to uh, Rowan Y gastric bypass, so which percentage are how many cases during this 14, 15 years? Yeah, I will say in my practice now, I do between probably 25 to 50 revisions from sleeve to bypass per year for reflux. 
So it's a, again, a very real number. It may not seem high to most people, but I think if you're thinking about two revisions per month, uh, at least, and sometimes up to four revisions per month, and we're only revising people that have very severely uh, intractable reflux for the most part. Again, we try to medically manage the folks that can be and only go to surgery for people that really are having intolerable reflux. Uh, and we work them up fully before that revision. So that means they get manometry, pH study, endoscopy, upper GI. So we like to say it's truly a proven issue. Um, now, I don't know that we did all the first time sleeves on these people, but either way, it's still telling you that in practices like ours, where you do revisional surgery, we're seeing these patients and uh, they are having not just mild reflux, they're having such severe reflux that they're having problems keeping food down. They're having spontaneous regurgitation and vomiting. Um, so uh, it's a serious issue and we, we need to get a little more down to the bottom of why is that happening and who should we just absolutely not do a sleeve on? Is there some commonality between these patients that should give us a red flag of saying this should stop us from doing a sleeve in this patient population? So this is a pretty number, uh, doctor. So for revisional, if we see, and also the main cause is intractable GERD after a sleeve. So in your practice or your opinion, what was the common cause of uh, intractable GERD after a sleeve in these cases? Yeah. So again, potentially an unpopular opinion, but I think uh, part of the dilemma with the sleeve having such a popular uptick in its early advent here in, in the States is that everybody was getting a sleeve. And I will say that there were a good number of patients that I've revised who had very active reflux prior to their sleeve. Uh, and people did not think it was going to be that big of a deal. So I think we have to be very wise in our patient evaluation. And now I do think too that the bariatric population knows this and the bariatric surgeons know that if someone has pre-existing reflux, you really have to have a very deep discussion with them about the sleeve gastrectomy. And if they have any severity to their symptoms, you really need to have a, a serious discussion about gastric bypass with them. I, I am surprised how many people I convert who had very well-established reflux before their sleeve. And I think that again, in our excitement about the sleeve gastrectomy being a straightforward surgery, relatively safe surgery, can be done in a lot of different types of patients, different body habitus, different build, et cetera, that maybe we did too many sleeves on too many people. And now we're feeling that after effect of, okay, I'm seeing them now some two years out, some five years out, some seven years out, and they're having reflux that is severe and we need to be maybe more selective in how we're um, evaluating these patients and who gets what type of surgery. Thank you, Dr. Doctor, uh, last not least question. This is a little political question. What is your opinion about endoscopic gastroplasty? Yeah, well, I'm really intrigued by the endoscopic gastroplasty. I think when I look at the results from these studies, the weight loss has been really intriguing. And I think it is quite promising in many respects. My dilemma with it is that I do do the overstitch um, technique for different things like stone multiplication, and I've done some ESGs as well. When I go back and look at them endoscopically at one year, two years, most commonly those T fasteners that have been placed have come loose and I see them dangling in the tissue. So my biggest concern is durability. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe Dr. Uh, Abu Dayez group out of Mayo, I believe um, just published about doing like an endoscopic mucosal resection combined with their sleeve gastroplasty to make that stick longer and make it more durable. I think if you could do something like that, you would have uh, an even better intervention that could potentially be more durable. You wouldn't have to worry and rely only on the T fasteners that are used that may not stay for a long-term period of time. I am a huge advocate for anything we can do to offer different types of, of procedures to treat obesity, right? Our patient population is continuing to grow in numbers across the world. We need more innovation and more ways to treat the patients. And the ESG, it might be something that makes this treatment more accessible to patients and we may be able to reach more people. So, so far I've, I've enjoyed the data. Again, I wanna see more durability to the actual procedure. Excellent, excellent. So, so Dr. your uh, message for our youngsters, uh, so who are now going to start a uh, sleeve gastrectomy, what's your message? My message is one, 
pre-screen your patients well, really get to know your patients and understand their goals. Get to know the data of looking at sleeves versus bypasses versus switches versus one anastomosis gastric bypass so that you can really legitimately offer your patients the best procedure for them considering their medical conditions. And then when you develop your technique and work on it, remember that um, improving your technique over time is not failure. I think sometimes we, we want to say, oh, this is how we've done it. This is how we always did it. But rather look at your outcomes, follow your outcomes and think about how can I make this even better? Because if we each strive to make it even better then we're doing a huge service to our patient. So always be willing to evolve, be open-minded, look at the data and really self-reflect on that and think about how can I adapt and change so that I make this an even better and safer surgery for my patients. Doctor, so much thanks. And really it was a practical interview that I like because personally I have learned a lot. This was a great message for our youngsters, especially who are just now going to do a sleeve gastrectomy. A sleeve is the most common bariatric surgery at this globe. But if you want to do, please follow these guidelines. Here, uh, so these uh, experts of a sleeve, if you will follow these technical points and also you will follow these tips and tricks, then you can do safe sleeve gastrectomy. Doctor, again, so much thanks for your support and definitely we need your support in future. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thanks a lot and viewers, so much thanks. I know in South Asia and also specific now midnight and also my European colleague also they are live with us and so my thank this interview and this academic activity is with your sport we need your sport and definite next week tuesday 10 pm dubai time we will be again live with another expert of sleeve gastrectomy so my thanks have a nice time thank you doctor <laughs>